I usually only have my travel investments so without something I actually have for the first time, probably in, I don't know how many years, an actual rose vestment. You know, one of those days, like Tari Sunday, we have the rose vestments for the day of the season of Lent. And the epistle for this uh, Tari Sunday, good to be here in Corona. <clears throat> In the epistle for this Lectaria Sunday, the fourth Sunday Lent is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 4. Brethren, it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. But he who was the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, but he who the free woman was by the promise. Which things are said by an allegory? For these are the two testaments, the one from Mount Sinai, engendering unto bondage, which is Agar. For Sinai is a mountain in Arabia, which hath affinity to that Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But that Jerusalem, which is above, is free, that is, our, which is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice thou, barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For many are the children of a desolate, more than of her that hath a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born according to the flesh, persecuted him that was after the Spirit. So also it is now. But what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not the children of the bondwoman, but of the free. By the freedom where the Christ has made us free. That's for the and the Gospel. Take that according to St. John chapter 6. At that time, Jesus went over to Galilee, which is that of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him, because they saw the miracles which he had, which he did on them that were diseased. Jesus therefore went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the now the past, the festival day of the Jews was near at hand. When Jesus therefore had lifted up his eyes and seen that a very great multitude cometh to him, he said to Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to try him. For he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that everyone may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, saith to him, There is a boy here who hath five barley loaves and two fishes. But what are these among so many? Then Jesus said, Make them in to sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. The men therefore sat down a number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to them that were set down, in like manner also of the fishes, so much as they would. And when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, lest they be lost. They gathered up therefore and filled twelve baskets with fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above to them that had eaten. Now those men, when they had seen what a miracle Jesus had done, said, This is of the truth, the prophet that is to come into the world. Jesus, therefore, when he knew that they would come to take him by force and make him king, fled again into the mountain, himself alone. That's for the words of today's Holy Gospel. Thank you, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Amen. This fourth Sunday, Litari Sunday, the Rejoice Sunday of the season of Lent, the middle of the season of Lent. A few considerations on one of the mysteries of the Blessed Sacrament, the Sacrament of Holy Communion. We tried to be a little bit more brief this morning. It was a bit long. We tried to be a little bit more brief. But a consideration of one of the mysteries of the Blessed Sacrament, and that is the temptation to receive Holy Communion. We, today we consider the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6. And whenever you hear the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6, you always know this is the chapter where Jesus Christ said that he is going to eat whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood shall have life in him. Unless, or rather, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall not have life in you. And my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Now just before this great miracle happened, we have the Gospel of today. The very beginning of the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6. And our Lord Jesus Christ multiplied the 5,000, the, the loaves for the 5,000, the five barley loaves and the two fishes. And there came back 12 baskets left over. We read also in the today about the burning bush. 
in the same scripture reading of the breviary today, we read about Moses. When Moses is called by God and he goes to see a burning bush after 40 years of being married and raising his children and not living the life that he should have lived as a Jew, he was just living like a pagan type of life. But after 40 years, as he was working there in the, in, with his sheep, he saw a burst bush burning in the mountains, which is not unusual at all. However, this particular bush was not consumed by the fire. There was a powerful fire, but it was not consumed. It did not consume the bush. And this fire is a symbol of what will happen in the New Testament to those souls that follow Christ. The presence of God was in that bush, and therefore it burnt and it burnt and it burnt, but the bush was not consumed. And if we are followers of Jesus Christ, we will burn and burn and burn. <coughs> but we shall not be worn out. We shall not be consumed. We shall be able to have a great fire and a great strength that shall continue all the way into eternity. And, we'll, and therefore the fire will burn in us, but it will not destroy us. It will not consume us. And this happens to those that are connected in a living way to the Blessed Sacrament. The Blessed Sacrament is, uh, is that we call the uh, Holy Communion. Uh, what is the communion of the Catholic Church? We are united together with others who receive the same body, the same blood, the same soul, and the same divinity that is Jesus Christ. And yet, we have two mysteries of the Blessed Sacrament. The first one is that when, I, when Moses, he got that burning bush, he saw a hit, he found the presence of God, he went and relieved the Jewish people out of Egypt, and they went in the desert, and they marched for 40 years in the desert. And they received manna every day during those 40 years. And when they received that manna, the manna was, of course, an obvious symbol of the Blessed Sacrament. And one aspect of the Blessed Sacrament, the manna fell every day. And you could gather up all the manna you want and eat all you want. But whoever tried to preserve the manna, it was corrupted the next day. So no matter how much what you preserved, no matter what method you used to save the manna, it didn't matter what it was, it was filled with worms, and it was completely corrupted and undigestible by any creature on the second day. But on the first day, it was the most fresh and wonderful food. It never, ever could be preserved. And this is the Blessed Sacrament, which is our daily bread. As we say in the Our Father, give us this day our daily bread, or in the Old English, our consubstantial bread. Give us this day our daily bread. That this bread is enough for one day. So that when we receive Holy Communion, once, the manna of the New Testament, the body and blood and soul of any of Jesus Christ, it is enough food for a day. Hence, one of the sacrileges that we see coming out of Vatican II, one of the many, many sacrileges, is the habit of Catholics to receive communion more than once a day. When you receive communion more than once, you commit a sacrilege. It's a mortal sin. And in fact, today I'm saying only my second Mass, but I would say three Masses, today it's only my second Mass. But when I, when I consume the body and blood and soul and divinity of Jesus Christ at this Mass, I will not be receiving Holy Communion. I've already received my Holy Communion. What I am doing with the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, that when the priest consumes the Blessed Sacrament, no matter how many Masses he says in one day, three, four, five Masses, he never receives Communion more than once. What is he doing at the Mass? He is destroying the victim. Completing the sacrifice. That's what's happening. That's why, for instance, at the Mass, if we were saying Mass outside, and the wind came and blew away the host after the consecration. A wild animal took the host. It mentions these things in the canon in, in the beginning of the Mass. What do you do in any possible situation? One is an animal may take the host. Another is the wind may blow the host away, and you cannot find it. Then what do we do? I cannot take a host out of the tabernacle and consume it. Because when I receive communion, when I consume the host of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass as a priest of God, offering the sacrifice, I am consuming and destroying the victim. And therefore, if the host could not be found, I have to get another host and consecrate, do the consecration a second time and consecrate another host and then consume that host. Because the sacrifice must be completed. That's what happens when the priest receives Holy Communion. He consumes and destroys the sacrifice. And only secondarily is there a reception of Holy Communion. We can only be communion received only once during the day, and to receive it more than once is a sacrilege. Give us this day our consubstantial bread. Give us this day our daily bread. It refers first to the Blessed Sacrament. And the first part of the mystery of the Blessed Sacrament is that it is food for a day. And it must be had, if possible, every day. And so one temptation that the devil gives, which is given to multiple saints... And to many Catholics down the last 2,000 years, 
You must receive Holy Communion every day. It's so important you receive Holy Communion. But in order to receive it, there are conditions made. And when these conditions are against God, to receive the Communion becomes a mortal sin. Hence, Saint, Saint, it says in the Gospel itself, or rather St. Paul, speaking of the Holy Eucharist, says, They who consume the Holy Eucharist unworthily, in the state of mortal sin, eat and drink unto their own destruction. They do receive the Blessed Sacrament because they're baptized and are capable of receiving the Blessed Sacrament, but they receive it unworthily and eat and drink unto their own destruction. And so one half of the mystery of the Blessed Sacrament is, it is our daily bread. But there's a second part of the mystery. Going back to the manna itself, Moses had died, and after Moses died, Joshua crossed the Red Sea. And before he crossed the Red Sea, it was the last day that the manna would fall. Not the Red Sea, but the River Jordan to go back to go into Israel. And before he crossed it, the manna fell for the last time. And Joshua took that manna, which is only good for one day, and he placed it inside of the Ark of the Covenant. Now the Ark of the Covenant still exists to this day. It is hidden. It was hidden by later by the Jeremiah, by the prophet Jeremiah, 600 years before Christ was born. It will come out again at the end of the world. And, the, and, the, and in that Ark of the Covenant, when Elias opens that Ark of the Covenant up, 3,500, 3,700 years after it was put away by, by Jeremiah, or after rather the Joshua put the, put the manna in the desert, in the, in the Ark, it will be incorrupted. That bread that could not last an entire day, that physical manna, which was sustenance for the body of the Jews, that manna is still uncorrupted in the Ark of the Covenant, and it shall remain incorrupted until the very ending of the world. And so the two mysteries of the manna, which is the Blessed Sacrament, on the one side, it is food for a day, and it is our daily bread, and we shall consume it often. Well, the exact same Holy Sacrament, if we consume it once in our lives, it is enough not only for our lifetime of only a hundred years, but it will preserve us for all eternity. This is a most sacred bread. And hence there is a second part of the mystery of the Blessed Sacrament, and that is, it is a sacrament of communion, a sacrament of union of the members of the mystical body of Christ. And hence to receive this sacrament out with those that are not in union with the mystical body of Christ is a sin. For instance, if I am celebrating the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, which is the sacrament of union in the church, and if Vitandus excommunicated, if Joe Biden was to walk into the church, if he were to walk into the church, then immediately he would have to stop the Mass. And if, it, and if he refused to leave the church, then no one would go to Mass that day. So there's a thousand people in the church. And a man who was notorious excommunicated, Vitandus, the most extreme type of excommunication, he is coming into the church, he the church by his presence. The server or someone in the pew must father, there is an excommunicated man. A normal excommunicated person does not desecrate a church. But the special excommunication, which is called excommunication of Vitandus, the most severe kind of excommunication that is public, those who walk into the church with that kind of excommunication, they desecrate the church. Why? Because this is the place of union. And I have to stop the Mass. The priest has to stop the Mass. If you will not leave, then the priest ceases the Mass altogether takes off his vestments, and leaves the church. And no one goes to Mass that day. Now the fact is, the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist is not just the body and blood and the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is a sacrament of union of faith. And hence, there have been ten temptations in history where saints have been told, one is to receive Holy Communion, and had they done so, they would be in, in hell right now. Joan of Arc, St. Joan of Arc, 19 years old, had never learned how to read, and she was judged by more than 20 priests, 20 to 30 priests, all of them saying the Latin Trinity Mass, judged by two bishops, neither one of them heretics. And these two bishops and these 20 to 30 priests, she spent the last part of her life only with priests and bishops. And these priests told her, as theologians of the church, as doctors of the church, as authorities of the church, you, Joan, you don't even know how to read. You had a hard time saying the Hail Mary when we asked you to say the Hail Mary. You had a difficult time saying the Our Father. You said, you said the Our Father, the Hail Mary, correctly, and you only learned it from your mother, and you know very few prayers, and you don't know theology, and you're telling me that, that St. Michael appeared to you, and that you spoke in heaven, and you're a minister, a ministress of God. 
Now we are telling you with all the wisdom of the church that this is not so, and you must agree with the authority of the church. And if you don't agree, it was her second to final temptation before she became a saint. If you don't agree, you will not be allowed to receive Holy Communion. But if you do agree, the priest will come in and will give you the Holy Eucharist. Had she agreed to lie, her communion would have been the sealing of her damnation. And then there is St. Hermenegild. Hermenegild was a son of the king. He was a prince. And he was in the land of Spain. And what happened to him? He was told also, you must receive Holy Communion at the Latin Tridentine Mass. There are Zindel Masses all around California. There is, there is, there's masses that, that are said by the diocese, by priests who say both the new and the old mass. There's masses said by priests approved by Rome, who are into the sky of the eternity of St. Peter, and they all say the Latin Mass. And Hermenegild went to the Latin Mass. There wasn't any other Mass at that time. It was only the Latin Mass. And he was, the bishop celebrating the Latin Tridentine Mass was going to give him Holy Communion. And in the church, he refused to receive Holy Communion, and therefore he was killed by the order of his own father, the king, in the church. He was killed because he refused to receive Holy Communion, and he is called Saint Hermenegild. And Joan of Arc was martyred, and the last attack they made against her before burning, telling her she would be burned at the stake was that she should receive Holy Communion. And they said, you are surely filled with the devil because you're refusing to go to Holy Communion. You're refusing to be able to go to Mass. All you have to do is say a lie and we will let you go to Mass. And she refused and she is called Saint Joan the Maid. And what about those 24 to 30 priests? We don't know their names. And if they didn't repent, they are all burning in hell. And what about those two bishops? They likewise are burning in hell. And they said the Latin Tridentine Mass every single day until the day they went to hell. And what does St. Paul say? Children, I would not have you ignorant. These are the words of the wisest and greatest of all the disciples and apostles of all time. Children, I would not have you ignorant that all the Jews were under the cloud. All the Jews ate the same spiritual food. The Jews drank the same spiritual drink, but with most of them, God was not well pleased. Two of them crossed the River Jordan that were over the age of 20. 600,000 crossed the Red Sea, and out of those 600,000, two, Joshua and Caleb, crossed the Red Sea, the River Jordan. All the 600,000 received the manna, all of them, and they died in the desert. And hence St. Paul says, you receive Holy Communion, does that mean you're a saint? You may be eating and drinking unto your own destruction. And what is happening to many souls today? They are being tempted by the temptation of St. Hermenegild, and they are being tempted by the temptation of St. Joan of Arc. The temptation to go to the Latin Mass. The temptation to receive Holy Communion. Because after all, all that matters is it's a valid Mass. St. Hermenegild, when he refused to receive the Holy Communion from the Arian, that Arian bishop said, and he said the Latin Tridentine Mass. And that was the same Mass celebrated by all those 30 priests and bishops who were around St. Joan of Arc. They only said the Latin Tridentine Mass. And with all of them, God was not well pleased. But St. John of Arc, he was pleased with. Now, what does God want us to recognize? Here we go back to the miracle of today. Today, our Lord multiplied 5,000 uh, loaves for the 5,000. And then tomorrow, what did he do? First of all, at the end of this day, he saw that they wanted to make him king. And they visited that encouraging. That's like voting for Trump. It's really encouraging. Everybody voted for Trump. They voted for Trump this last time, too. More voted for Trump this time than they did before. Isn't that wonderful? How many saints do you see in Corona, California? How many people that love God do you see here? They all voted for Trump. And everybody prefers Pope Benedict over Pope Francis. Isn't that wonderful? You prefer Satan over Beelzebub. Take your pick. But the fact is that this is not where wonder is. Our Lord Jesus Christ saw them. They believe he's God. They believe he's the prophet. They want to make him king. They say indeed he's the prophet. And the Lord Jesus Christ is disgusted. He is in a state of absolute anguish of spirit. And he flees them. 
and he fled into the mountain. He fled into the mountain. He did not flee when the mob came to put him to death. He didn't flee when he was about to be killed, and he was killed. He would not run away. But from these people who say they believe in him, like he said about his followers so many times, with their mouths they praise me, but their hearts are far from me. Is the world better today in 2021 than it was in 1999? In 1999... Anyone who went to Latin Mass was considered excommunicated and outside the church, except for those few people who went to the very few during St. Peter churches that existed at that time. But now, 20 years later, there are so many more Latin Masses. There are so many more people going to Latin Masses. There are so many more families doing these Latin Masses and trying to live a moral life. Surely the church is better. Surely the world is better. But what did Our Lady of Fatima say? And what did Our Lady of La Salette say? Our Lady of Quito say? They said, things are not going to get better. They are going to get worse. And here is the fact of 2021. In the year 2021, there are many more priests celebrating the Latin Mass than there were in 1988. In the year 2021... There are hundreds of times more faithful, at least 10, 20 times more faithful, attending the Latin Mass than there were in 1988. And yet the Holy Mother said in 2021, before the consecration of Russia, it will be worse than it was in 88. And yet many souls say that, well, there's more Masses. It's certainly encouraging. Quota modo, we say in Latin, in a certain way. In, in a certain way, it's a kundum quit. In a certain way, yes. There's more Latin Masses. But these Masses are not in union with Christ. They are not holding the true faith. And they are not leading souls to God as they should be. They are teaching only three words that, are, that Bishop Sheen said very wisely about the modern Christian. He says the modern Christian priest, the modern Catholic priest, all he does is do three words. He preaches cheap moral platitudes. This is what we find. Cheap moral platitudes. Pay your taxes. Don't beat your wife too, wife too often. Let's say you love Jesus. Uh, go to confession. Be spiritual. Say your rosary. Be holy. But what about the holy faith upon which all these things stand? This faith is not the center. What is it? Why are we here at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass? Not only to worship God, for we worship God every day, whether we're able to go to Mass or not. But our attendance at the Mass is the public worship of God with our fellow Catholics. And hence it is more than just me worshiping God and me receiving Holy Communion. Because the Blessed Sacrament and the Church is not like a Coke machine. Or what's worse, a Pepsi machine. It is not like a Pepsi machine. You push the button and out comes a Pepsi. You push the button and out comes a Pepsi. You go to church and out comes Jesus. You push the button and out comes Jesus. And if you push the button and Jesus doesn't come out, then why am I going to go to that church? We have turned our Lord Jesus Christ and blessed sacrament into Pepsi. We've turned him into a cheap thing that we're going to receive. And do one, does anyone think that this does not anger God the Father, who sent his only begotten Son to this earth in order to be our redemption and our salvation and our King? He did not ask to the kingdom of heaven. And hence, Catholics will have to make a choice. Do we want the Holy Communion or do we want Christ? So many souls receive our Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh, and they do not receive him in the heart. Their lips speak his praise. Their body receives are far from God. This is not the, the wisdom of God. Hence, what do we do? Go to Mass. This evil temptation to go to Mass. This evil temptation to receive Holy Communion and therefore cover up our consciences. We must receive the Holy Communion in union with the faith of the church and the church of all times. We don't receive Holy Communion in, in a way that is sacrilegious. We don't receive Holy Communion in a way, in a place where there's not <laughs> union with God. As St. John the Almsgiver said back in the 700s, a holy bishop, St. John the Almsgiver said, My children, I would that you never take Holy Communion ever again in your entire life than that you receive from the hands of a schismatic or the hands of a heretic. St. Hermenegild was a martyr because of that. St. Joan of Arc, it was part of her temptation that she had to overcome in order to become a saint and a martyr. And others have died because of that, have been excommunicated because of that. 
Our masses are unapproved, unapproved, unapproved. By what? By who? Unapproved by the devil. Unapproved by modernist Rome. But we are approved by our Holy Mother of the Church. They are approved by God in heaven. And we must stay where the approval counts. We obey God rather than men. And we obey men when those men are in union with God or when they're operating as they should be in union with God. But we don't obey them when they work against God. And hence, in our present crisis in the church, beware of the temptation to receive Holy Communion and also beware of thinking that because they received our Lord, because they said, indeed, he is a prophet, everything is right. The apostles were very encouraged on the day of the gospel today. Everybody wants to make him king. Everyone says he's a prophet. Now we know we're making some headway and turned around and Jesus Christ was gone in the mountain himself alone. Why did he do that? The next day he came back down and then he said, my, my, my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed. And what happened? This time the people ran away and Jesus Christ did not run away. The day before, which is the gospel of this late Saturday Sunday, Christ ran away. But on the day in which he said, this is my body, this is my blood, which you must eat, and who does not eat it shall not have life in him. And they said, this is cannibalism. And they were disgusted. And the 5,000 only counts the men and not the women and children. So 20,000 people were there, and they all walked away. And so many walked away. that The Lord Jesus Christ said to his apostles, will you 12 men leave me also? And they didn't have anything to say until the great St. Peter on the beginning of his journey to become a saint, said, Lord, I don't understand either. I don't know why you ran away in the mountain by yourself alone last night. I don't know how we can eat your flesh and drink your blood and not be cannibals. I don't understand what you're saying. They say it's a hard saying, and I agree, it's a hard saying. But I do know this. To whom shall we go? For thou alone hast the words of eternal life. I'm not going anywhere. I don't understand you are the prophet, and you are the Messiah. And even though I don't understand, it's just because of my poorness of intellect. I'm not going anywhere. And imagine the comfort that that weak Peter, imagine the words and how much it comforted the heart of Christ when he heard those words from St. Peter. To whom shall we go? We, thou alone, hast the words of eternal life. It does not fall for the temptation of receiving communion. And going to the adult masses, where our faiths are being slowly, slowly taken away from us. And the world and the church is not getting better. What is happening is a new Protestant religion is being formed. See, there's the low church, Anglicans, and there's a high church. And now there is the highest church, which is the half-Catholics, who have a Latin mass and vestments. Just very recently, visiting someone who has beautiful vestments. He has very beautiful vestments and very wonderful taste. Magnificent vestments but not the faith that goes along with it. We don't just need beautiful vestments and nice incense. We need the faith. And the faith can be without the churches, as St. Athanasius said 1,700 years ago. They have the churches. They have the buildings. We have the faith. What lasts is the faith. And so therefore, let us not lower ourselves to the false receiving of Holy Communion in the wrong places, and let us ask the grace to see the truth and follow the truth wherever it leads us. And don't fall into the temptations of the devil, including the temptations under the appearance of good. Those who God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.